Fish in a Tree by Linda Mullally Hunt. Chapter 43. Set the World on Fire. Page 223. After the teasing that Albert has taken for his shirt, Keisha and I decide to do something for him. The teasing hasn't seemed to bother him that much, but it bothers us. So we've made our own shirts to go with his. We walk up behind him while he is organizing his papers into piles. Albert, do you like our shirts? I ask. He turns around and stares at me with a shirt that says steel and Keisha with a shirt that says magnesium. I think it's the first time I've ever seen Albert truly confused. Okay, Keisha says, get it? They match your shirt. But not the genius guy alone on the rock in space with his robots thing, because I told you I thought that was a bit creepy. Albert is still confused, so I interrupt. The shirts match because the three of us together are going to set the world on fire, like Mr. Daniels says. Yes, he says. Flint, steel, and magnesium are commonly used together for fire starters. I get it. The corner of Albert's mouth twitches, which is like someone else doing cartwheels down the hall. Without thinking, I yell to Shay across the room, Hey, you tease one of us, you tease all of us. Shay has an expression like she's just smelled rotten meat, and it makes Keisha and me laugh really hard. Then I pat Albert on the back. Just wanted you to know that you can always count on us. Well... That would make you either a set of fingers or an abacus. Uh, Albert, seriously? Keisha shakes her head and then leans forward. It means we think you're a cool dude. We're allies, I smile. He goes back to arranging his papers. Yes, I know, he says softly. I am most grateful. Chapter 44, Tales of a Sixth Grade Something, page 225. Travis drives me to school because the project I did for our book report is too hard to take on the bus. I've always used my art for projects at school, but this is a three-dimensional scene on a piece of wood, a scene from A Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, the book that Mr. Daniels gave me to read. What's gone into you? Travis asks. Since when do you smile like that on a Monday morning? I'm going to school feeling proud for once, so I just sit there continuing to smile. Hey, he says, hitting me on the side of the leg. I'm happy to see you so happy about school, Al. He laughs a bit. To be honest, I wouldn't mind feeling some of that. When I get to class, lots of kids surround me. I guess it's because the project is so big. Shay is the first to come over. She looks at the kitchen scene I have made mostly of paper, including a working light over the sink that Travis helped me make. How did you do that? Shay asks, pointing at the lit light over the sink. There's a battery underneath. She looks disgusted. And you made that? Oliver comes over and grabs for the light. Cool! Before I can move, he knocks the wire, which makes the light go off. Shay begins, Oliver, you're such a... Leave him alone. I interrupt. If I don't care, you shouldn't. Shay and Oliver are both wide-eyed, but for different reasons. Oliver smiles a little. It's okay, Oliver. I'll fix it. Shay is squinty-eyed for a bit and then laughs in a way that is louder than normal. She's pointing at my project. I read that book, like, four years ago, and there aren't any soldiers in it. She says, pointing at a picture hanging on the wall of the room I made. Max comes over. What's up? She has a picture in here that has nothing to do with the book. Book report, Allie? Should be about the book? Well, I say, feeling a little warm all of a sudden. Most houses have art on the walls, so I figured I'd decorate the room and drew a picture of my dad in his uniform. Wait! Max brightens. Your dad is in the army? Yeah. That's cool. What does he do? He's a captain with the tank division. Your father drives tanks? Seriously? That's awesome! I look up. Thanks. He holds up his fist to fist bump me, and as he walks away, he tells the other guys about my dad. From the look on Shay's face, she can tell that her insult backfired on her. Then Mr. Daniels comes over. He's wearing a tie with books on it. Wow, Allie, that is amazing! He leans forward and drops his voice. I am really proud of you. My response is stuck in my throat. I watch a series of movies in my head, trying to see a time when a teacher has said this to me. There isn't one. Allie, he says, still I can't speak. Usually when I find myself unable to speak, it's because I'm humiliated. I like this feeling a lot more. Chapter 45, My Brother's Question, page 228. I'm working on pictures of cupcakes that talk for an ad campaign for Keisha's business. She asked me to help her. feels great to have someone ask me for help. As I draw, I think about my sketchbook and how I love it but don't draw it as much anymore. It used to be the only thing that made me happy. Now I have other things, too. I hear Travis chewing gum in the doorway before I see him. Without looking up, I say, Mom told you to stop chewing gum like a goat. The whole room is not supposed to hear you. 
He goes silent. Weird. I finish erasing a line and look over at him. He looks kind of stiff, hands stuffed in his pockets. Then he takes one hand out and brushes his chin with his fist. Travis, what's wrong? I just wanted to ask you a question. You want to borrow money or something? He does that half smile of his and shakes his head, but I can see the seriousness. You can ask me anything you want, Travis. What is it? He comes over and sits on the side of the bed. That teacher of yours, Mr. Daniels, what does he do after school with you? You mean chess? He shakes his head. No, the reading. What does he do? I mean, do you just sound out words and stuff? I put down my pencil. Well, we talk about words, but it's not the same as other teachers. Like, we never use paper, ever. He has me write letters in blue or pink sand or sometimes in shaving cream. Really? So you can read now? Well, not yet, but it's getting easier. It can be like running up the side of a building sometimes. I get so tired, but I am doing better. So it helps. What he does? Yeah, it's more fun than learning the old way. Sometimes it's boring because he'll do a list of words that have some of the same letters in them, like light and might and night. He writes the letters that repeat in every word in red and the rest in black. Then he makes the words into pictures so I can remember them better. I flip my paper over. Here, I'll show you. And I write sun with all these little lines around it pointing outward to look like the sun. And that really helps you remember it. Yeah, and he also has these sheets of plastic that I can see through but are different colors. He puts those over pages and it makes the headaches better. It's like turning the brightness down on a computer. It's weird. No more headaches from reading? Really? Well, I still get them, but they're not nearly as bad. Like a little stick hitting my head compared to a baseball bat. Travis smiles and then stands up. Well, I'm glad he's helping you. And I'm glad that you have Keisha and Albert squirt. You're doing great. You're doing great too, Travis. Not long before you'll open up Nickerson Restoration, right? He nods once and turns to leave. He doesn't talk about the neon sign he'll have for the big rolling tool tool cases or anything. I miss hearing his mouth running like a motor about all his plans. Travis? He turns. Yeah? I could try to help you. Nah, he says, brushing his chin with his knuckles. I don't need you to do that. I was just wondering. Chapter 46. Flying Tigers and Baby Elephants. Page 232. Well, Allie, Albert says to me at lunchtime, before I really knew you, I used to call you the Flying Tiger. Ooh, Albert, that's a great name, Keisha says. Like fierce, like nobody messes with her, right? I wish that described me, but it doesn't. Why in the world would he nickname me that? I thought that Albert paid more attention to things. I look up and he is watching me. Well, he asks, aren't you wondering why I called you that? I shrug. It's not an insult, just my observation. I shrug again. Fine, tell me then. Before the United States entered World War II, there were a bunch of American pilots in China. They were called the Flying Tigers. They flew those planes with the shark teeth on the nose. Wait, I say, my dad and brother love those planes. He nods once as I try hard to shake out the mind movie of me as an airplane. They did not have many planes, so they would repaint them every few missions, change a bit of the design and the numbers so that the Japanese would think there were far more of them than there really were. I sort of know what he means. I've watched you trying to figure out how to repaint yourself for other people all the time, trying to make them think one thing about you when the opposite was true, like with the teachers, always getting sent to the office. Wow, I can't believe Albert noticed all this. Okay, Keisha asks, do you name everyone like that? I like analogies. They interest me and help me understand. What about me? Do you have a nickname for me? He hesitates. Page 234. Okay, Professor, spill it, Keisha says. He bites his lip. Listen, you better tell me and tell me now. The baby. What? The baby? Are you kidding me? She gets a great name like the flying tiger and you call me the baby? What the heck is that supposed to mean? He turns red. I didn't want to offend you. Well, it's just a little too late for that. I'm going to send you into space where no man has gone before. No kidding. Is Keisha quoting Star Trek now? The girl has lost her mind. I called you the baby because when you're quiet, you're taking everything in. When you want something, you're loud about it and usually get your way pretty fast. I burst out laughing. Oh, man, Keisha, that is just too perfect. She folds her arms with a bit of a humph, but then begins to laugh, too. Albert, do you have one for yourself? I ask. When he doesn't say no, I know it means yes. Tell us! Keisha says. I'm the elephant. Because you're big? I ask. No, Keisha says, because he has a good memory. Elephants do have good memories, he says, but that isn't why I chose it as my symbolic name. Then why? I ask. Well, I've become a pachyderm. Is that a religion? I ask. His face twitches a bit. No, an elephant is a pachyderm. It means an animal with a thick skin. 
I guess we're all pachyderms then. Or we pretend to be. His finger picks at the side of his thumb. Elephants feel a wide range of emotions, but their behavior remains constant. On the outside, happy and sad often look the same. I can't remember the last time I had nothing to say about something. All this time, I thought that Albert was the science guy with as much feeling as a pine cone, but I was wrong. All that watching he does, all that thinking, he really does understand things. He definitely gets me. Chapter 47. Great minds don't think alike. Mr. Daniels looks really happy as he makes an announcement to us one morning. Today, my fantasticos, we are going to jump from our social studies unit and talk a little bit about some famous people. People I bet some of you know. He takes out pictures and stands them up on the tray of the board. They almost cover the length of it, and I worry that we will have a test or have to write about our favorite. Mr. Daniels seems electric. I'll say the name, and then you tell me if you know why they're famous. Deal? No need to raise your hands. Just call out. Wow, he's breaking the biggest teacher rule ever. He points to the first picture. Thomas Edison. Wait, I know who that is. I squeak out. He invented the light bulb? Great, Allie. But if you know, don't answer like a question. Declare your answer. I imagine myself at a podium in front of thousands of people, arms in the air, declaring my answer. What about this one? He asks. Max says, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. I did a report on him. Most excellent work, Mr. Daniel says. The next one is George Washington. Everyone knows that one. Henry Ford? He asks. He invented the car, I declare. Well, he did begin Ford Motor Company, but he didn't invent the car. He perfected the moving assembly line, which was a very clever way to build a lot of cars fast. Oh. Allie, how do you know about these inventors? My mom bought a DVD called Schoolhouse Rock. It has a cartoon about inventors. Ah, yes, Schoolhouse Rock is awesome. Next one? Albert Einstein. He says this one like he's introducing someone on a game show. Page 238. Albert raises his hand. Yes, Albert? Albert Einstein was born in Germany on March 14, 1879. He is considered the greatest human mind to ever have lived in the fields of physics, mathematics, and philosophy. He changed all of science with his ideas. My father said that the field of science was like Pinocchio as the puppet, and Einstein changed it into a real boy. Does he really? Mr. Daniels laughs. That's brilliant. Is your father a scientist, Albert? Yes, sir. He named me after Albert Einstein, so I know a lot about him. Keisha whispers to him, Is that why you style your hair after him? She turns to me. That boy has never even seen a comb. Style my hair? Albert asks, confused. Mr. Daniels walks back toward the pictures. I have a feeling that Albert's father is quite a scientist indeed. We go through the rest of the pictures. Leonardo da Vinci, famous painter of the Mona Lisa, also a gifted inventor. Pablo Picasso, another famous painter who created a modern style that no one had ever even seen before. Patricia Polacco, talented illustrator and author, illustrator and author. Whoopi Goldberg, hilarious comedian, comedian and actress. Henry Winkler, famous actor and author. Muhammad Ali, world heavyweight champion in boxing. John F. Kennedy, 35th president of the United States. Winston Churchill, prime minister of England during World War II. His intelligence and grit kept the Nazis from taking over England. In fact, all these people had grit to spare. Grit. I like that word. John Lennon of the Beatles, Walt Disney, creator of Mickey Mouse. Then Mr. Daniels stands back. Don't you all agree that this is a stunning group of talent? Is there anyone here that would be willing to stand up and say that any of these people were stupid? Everyone shakes their heads. Albert gave us a great rundown of Albert Einstein. But did you know that he was kicked out of school when he was young? His report card said that he was too slow to amount to anything. He couldn't memorize the months of the year. In fact, he had trouble tying his shoes. But... He was and remains one of the greatest minds we've ever seen. I remember when I had a hard time tying my shoes. Travis sat with me for a long time teaching me the baby way where you make the rabbit ears. Page 240. I stare at Einstein's picture with his crazy white hair that looks like he had an accident with a light socket. How could he figure out something like time travel and not know the months of the calendar? Mr. Daniel says, Some people say that John Lennon is one of the most gifted spiritual musicians ever. He walks over and points to Walt Disney. What about this guy? Did you know he was told by a teacher that he wasn't creative enough? He moves over. How about Henry Ford? He was born understanding how an engine should work. He just knew without studying it. Hey, that's like Travis. He walks toward the windows. Knew exactly how it should go together. He never went to school for it, but he was such a genius with machines. He worked as Thomas Edison's engineer for a while. He built his first car by hand by building a motor and putting it in between two bicycles. And with his idea of using a moving assembly line, he ushered in a new world. He walks back toward the board. 
You know what all these people have in common? He asks the class. Then he stands in front of my desk and looks me dead in the eye. Many believe they all had dyslexia. I feel it in my gut. In fact, I feel it everywhere. He smiles a bit. That's right. As children, they struggle to read even simple words. And based on some other clues as well, most experts now believe that they had dyslexia. But of course, we know their struggles weren't because they were stupid. It's just that their minds work differently. And thank goodness they did. Because otherwise, we may not have telephones or light bulbs or stunning works of art. He smiles. Oh, and we won't have Mickey Mouse. He is quiet for a while. I think he's letting it sink in. So then, for your homework, I have an extra credit assignment. He turns on the smart board and there's writing. J-U-J-T, N-V-D-I, I-B-S, E-F-S, U-P, S-F-B-E, X-I-F-O, Z-P-V, E-P-O-U, I-B-W-F, U-I-F, D-P-E-F, period. The class is already complaining that they can't read it, complaining that it makes no sense. It's a code, he says. Each letter stands for another. Extra credit for anyone who can crack it. It isn't exactly like reading with dyslexia, but it will give you a taste of how hard it is, how long it takes. Then he looks at me, and how smart you have to be to persevere. He dismisses us, and everyone starts to get ready to go home. But I'm still staring at the pictures of all those famous people, and wondering if they felt like me when they were young. Did they feel stupid? Did they wonder what would become of them? Mr. Daniel squats next to me. Allie? Although the room is loud, it's like the sounds are far away. Are you okay, Allie? Mr. Daniels asks. I turn to him and have to clear my throat before speaking. It's true? All those people there? I look back at their pictures. All those people couldn't read like me? Indeed, he says, smiling. Not that they couldn't read. They just needed to learn a different way. That's all. He puts an oval-shaped piece of metal in front of me. This is a paperweight, he says. It's a gift for you. For me? Yes, look. He points at each word as he reads them. Never, never, never quit. Winston Churchill. I pick it up. It's heavy. I'm not giving it to you as a reminder because I know that you will keep at it. I've really gotten a sense lately of how hard you've had to work to learn what you have. And, he says laughing, you fooled a lot of smart people. So how smart does that make you? I swallow hard. I'm giving it to you because I want you to know that I've noticed and that you're going to be okay, Allie. He leans forward a bit. Better than okay, actually. My head swims with all that's changed in school and in me. Chapter 48, Oliver's Idea of Lucky, page 244. So what's it like? Oliver asks before his body has even come to a stop in front of my desk. What's it like, this thing you have, dystopia or whatever? Dyslexia? Yeah, what's it like? Well, I begin but don't have an answer. Don't you see everything backward? That's what I hear. He squints. Wait, do you see me backward right now? I shake my head. No, I don't think so. Then, a mind movie of the butterflies at the museum drops into my head, and I look back up at him. It's kind of like the letters on the page flutter like butterflies. His face scrunches up. Wait, you mean they move? The letters move? I nod. His eyes widen. That is so cool. You're so lucky. Letters just stand there all boring when I read. I hate reading. I'd rather do anything in the world than read. Really? I ask wishing that the letters would just stand still for me and wait to be read. He gasps a little, as if he can't believe that I don't agree. Ah, uh, yeah, are you kidding me? Last summer, my mother kept giving me the choice of reading or washing her car. She had the cleanest car in the neighborhood all summer long. I smile because I really like Oliver. I've been thinking about myself so much, I never really noticed how funny he is. And looking around the room, I remember thinking that my reading differences were like dragging a concrete block around every day, and how I felt sorry for myself. Now I realize that everyone has their own blocks to drag around, and they all feel heavy. I think of that word Mr. Daniels used when he talked about the famous people with dyslexia. Grit. He said it's being willing to fail but try again, pushing through and sticking with something even if it's hard. He also told us that a lot of those famous people were not afraid to make mistakes no matter how many they made. I think messing up will bother me less than it used to. Keisha, Albert, and I are hanging out on the playground when Shay and a few of her clones come over. So, you really have that thing that Mr. Daniels was talking about, right? Shay asks. Yeah, I say, feeling proud of it after his talk. So, dyslexia, don't you see letters backward or something? Sort of, I reply. Not sure exactly, since I've never seen letters the way other people have. Figures, she says. My brother's in kindergarten. He can see them the right way. She looks at me like she always has. It bugs me, but not like it used to. Albert steps forward. Do you ever see letters backward, Shay? No, are you kidding me? Oh, Albert says, dropping his voice. Too bad. Why is that too bad? 
Oh, well, you know, it's a sign of intelligence. And then this thing just comes over Albert, like he's all relaxed and everything, standing in a way that isn't all stiff and Albert-like. I know that you think I'm a nerd and everything, he says to her. I mean, you've called me all kind of things, but there's one thing you've never called me. What could that be? Dumb. You've never called me dumb. She swings her hip to the side and sighs. What is your point, Albert? Well, there are a lot of letters that I've always seen backward, and Allie sees more than I do. So who knows how smart she must be? Wait. Albert sees letters backward? Shay's thinking about it, looking like she just found out that she's the only one not invited to a party. What letters do you see backward? Well, O-I-T-A-M-V-X-U and some others. Huh? Wow. Shay had a loss for words. I never thought I'd see that. Come on, she finally says. I have better things to do. I'm going to the bathroom, Jessica says. I'll be there in a second. Obviously... Shay says, you wouldn't dare not be. Shay leaves and her group follows. They don't all stomp away like they usually do. A few walk behind her, half looking back. Jessica turns and jogs back to us, and I can tell right away she's different. Hey, I think it's cool. The dyslexia? And you really are a good artist, she says, and then turns to walk away again. Then stops, turns back. And I'm really sorry, Allie, for everything, she says before turning to run this time. My mom was right. I'm sorry, our powerful words. So, Mr. Science, Keisha says, turning toward Albert, did the word just fall off its axis or what? Did I just see what I think I did? We all watched Jessica run up the hill. Well, he says, there is an explanation. Allie is a catalyst. Not sure what that means, but from Albert, it must be good. All of a sudden, Keisha starts cracking up, bending over with her hands resting on her knees, stumbling around like she's going to fall over. God, Albert, I can't believe you did that with the letters, and I can't believe she went for it. Albert cracks a smile. Keisha puts her arm around my shoulder. Albert here just gave Shay a whole bunch of letters that are the same forward and backward. If she wasn't spitting nails mad, trying to hurt people, she probably would have figured it out. Then I laugh, too. Thanks, Albert, I say. Shay is going to hate you more than she hates me soon. No worries, Keisha says. That girl has plenty of hate to go around. And I realize it is easier now that Shay and everyone else know why I have so much trouble. Mr. Daniel says I should concentrate on what I do well. I'm going to try to do that. When I get back to my desk, there is a wooden A on it. I pick it up and wonder where it came from. Allie, my grandfather would like you, says Suki. I carved this letter from one of his blocks. It is for you. A for Allie. But also, I think you are amazing, and I admire you. I wanted you to know that. I swallow the lump in my throat. Thanks a lot, Suki. Now I I can tell everyone I finally got an A at school, and we both laugh. I hear Shay across the room, but she doesn't sound happy. There's something on her desk, too. A pile of old friendship bracelets. Page 250, chapter 49. I see the light. During break time, Albert and Keisha are talking about her new ideas for recipes. Jessica and Max and some other kids are laughing about something while Shay sits at her desk watching them. She seems like she's not sure what to do, which is an odd thing to see. Finally, she stands and walks over. However, they don't really acknowledge her, especially Jessica. Something about it reminds me of those empty Sunday dishes back when Shay and Jessica made me feel small for being me. Now it's hard to imagine feeling that way. Oliver is going from desk to desk. As he does, kids are holding their arms over their heads to make a big circle. Then he says something and they answer. When they do, he jumps and laughs. Finally, he gets to Shay and I could hear what he's saying. Hold your arms up over your head to make a circle. She hesitates but does it, which surprises me. Now, Oliver says, spell image and then say light bulb. I-M-A-G-E, light bulb. Oliver jumps and laughs. Shay drops her arms. You're such a freak, Oliver. Go stink somewhere else. He goes to Keisha and they do the same thing with the arms, but she laughs afterward. And I feel happy for Oliver because I remember a time when he would have sat down and been sad after Shay had said something like that. Looking at Shay, I can tell she's looking around the room wondering where she fits in now, wondering how all of this happened. I remember how it felt to be alone in a room full of people. So I take a deep breath and head over. Hey, Shay. Now that I'm close to her, I can really see how upset she is. What do you want? Um, I just thought I'd say hi. While she stares at me, all of the mean things she's done wind through my head, and I wonder if I've made a mistake in coming over. I think, she says, we should call you Alley Cat from now on. Go bother someone else. At first, I'm surprised, but then I realize it wasn't a mistake to come over, because it felt like the right thing. Shay's the one who decided to act mean, but at least I tried. 
I have to admit, though, I do feel sorry for her. Chapter 50, A Hero's Job, page 253. Keisha, Albert, and I take our time walking home. A voice behind us calls, Hey, brain, wait up! We turn around and I hear Albert mumble, Oh, no. I've never actually seen anyone turn white before, but he does. I look back at these three boys who are all running toward us. Albert is jumpy like he's going to run, too, and I know that they must be the kids that beat on him all the time. I wish Travis were here. Who are they? Keisha asks. Albert swallows hard. Hey, brain, the one closest says. Are these your girlfriends? He asks. The group laughs. One in back says, yeah, right, like that dwee would have a girlfriend. He'd be lucky to get a pet bird. They both, oh, excuse me, they laugh harder. Keisha steps forward. Why don't you just get lost? Don't think so. I'm right here where I'm supposed to be. He turns to Albert and shoves him. Hey, brain, did you miss me? Like a dog misses a flea. Albert mumbles, his eyes glued to the ground. I wish you'd at least look at the kid. Keisha's voice gets louder. Yeah, like a little flea. Now get lost before someone slaps you. Before I can even start worrying for her, the boy grabs her arm and pushes her on the ground. Slaps me? I don't think so. Hey! Albert says, you leave her alone. The boy turns to Albert. Shut up, brain, or you're next. The second boy picks up Keisha's bag. What do you have here? He turns it upside down, dumping everything out. Look, the third says, a book with sweet little cupcakes. No! Keisha yells, give me my book back. Albert is shaking, actually shaking. Hey, I say, you leave us alone. And when the kid turns and looks into my eyes, I'm really scared, like I'm going to throw up. Page 255. Keisha tries to get up, and the first boy pushes her back down again. He moves his foot to step on her, but doesn't get the chance. Albert. Peace-loving, I will never stoop to their level. Albert pulls the boy away from Keisha. He turns him around and holds him by the front of his coat. The boy's toe has barely touched the ground. You do not touch her again, Albert says with a voice I didn't think he had. Keisha jumps up and runs over to me. She stands next to me, squeezing my arm hard. I'm tired of you beating on me all the time, Albert says. You have no right to treat me like that, and you don't even fight one-on-one. You gang up on people like cowards. Albert throws him down on the ground, tosses him like he doesn't weigh anything. The two other boys charge, but Albert grabs one and throws him on top of the first kid. Boy three runs. The first boy stands up. You want to fight, Brain? I'll fight you. He charges Albert and hits Albert in the stomach. I've never seen Albert mad before. He hits the kid one time and the kid goes down. Through his moans, he tells his friend to get up and fight, to get Albert for him. The second boy sits up like he's thinking about it. Albert's feet are far apart and he leans forward. Do you really think you want to do that? The boy shakes his head. Albert takes a step toward both boys on the ground. Don't you ever touch my friend again, ever, or you'll answer to me. Keisha and I gather her stuff and put it back in her bag. Come on, Albert says, looking at us before turning to walk away. We follow him. I'm surprised that Keisha is quiet for as long as she is. I feel like I'm going to cry, thinking how Albert has come to school every day with those bruises for all this time. We always asked him what it would take for him to fight back. Turns out it was protecting us. Albert, Keisha says, that was amazing, and you can't fight. I can't take credit for strong arms. But, I say, it wasn't just your arms, Albert. You were seriously brave back there. Yep, that's true, Keisha says. Then she laughs. So, Albert, what got into you anyway? My dad has always said that violence is something to avoid at all cost, Albert tells us. But he has also said that you never hit a girl. So I had to weigh the two. I just... Then he stops walking, and he's wide-eyed looking at me. It gives me a chill the way he does it. But really, he says, it just made everything hurt inside to watch them hurt you too, and I would have done anything in the universe to stop it. When we arrive at A.C. Peterson's, Keisha is still acting out what Albert had done. He never says anything, but he seems quietly happier and a bit taller. After sliding into the booth, I take out my social studies book. Seriously, you're going to do homework after that? Keisha asks. I have a lot to do. I thought Mr. Daniel said you only had to do half of the questions. He did, but I want to try to do them all. I don't want to get off easy. I figured out that if I look at the first two letters and the last two letters of a word, I can sometimes figure it out from the rest of the sentence. This trick I've discovered made Mr. Daniel say I'm a genius. What is wrong with you? Are you serious? Keisha asks. Yeah, I know. First I don't want to do work, and now I want to do extra. You're, you are a mystery, that's for sure, she says. Huh, Albert says. That reminds me of our president, Teddy Roosevelt, who went on a hunting trip and found that one of his companions tied a bear to a tree for him so it would be easy to shoot. He refused to shoot the bear and set it free. In fact, that's why teddy bears are called Teddy, after that president and that day. Keisha shakes her head. Man, you've got a story for everything, Albert. I do not provide the stories. History does. 
You know, Albert, you kind of talk like those guys who narrate the movies at school, from the History Channel and stuff. Why, thank you, Keisha. Based on Keisha's expression, I'm not sure it was a compliment exactly. I lean forward and look at Albert. You know what else is a tremendous achievement? What? Sticking up for friends against guys that have used you as a punching bag for months. You wailed on them, didn't you, Albert? You should get a medal or something. Albert sits a bit straighter. Well, it was just one thing I did on one day. He turns to me. Not like you, Allie. Huh? When Mr. Daniels told us about people with dyslexia, I mean, some of the greatest minds the human race has ever seen, I've been kind of wishing I could have it, too. Did he really just say that? Keisha laughs. Sometimes, Albert, I've thought you have nothing but facts stacked up in that head of yours. And then you do what you did today and say something like that. You know what you are? His eyebrows jump. Keisha leans forward. You are one good friend, Albert. Chapter 51. C-O-U-R-A. Genius. Page 260. I asked Mr. Daniels if I can renew my book at the library, and he smiles like I gave him a cake. Sure, he says. Then he hands me an envelope. Since you're heading that way, will you give this to Mrs. Silver for me? Sure. You have to hand it to her, though, and you have to wait until she opens it and writes a response, and then return it to me, okay? I nod, thinking back to the days when a visit to the office meant trouble. I renew my book and then head to the office. Mrs. Silver is there when I walk in. She smiles. Hey there, Allie. I hold out the envelope even before I start talking. I guess I want her to know right away that I'm not in trouble. I have a message from Mr. Daniels. She holds up a finger, telling me to wait one minute while she speaks with her daughter and picks up the phone. I mean to listen in on the conversation, but something else catches my attention. The poster with the two hands reaching for each other. The one I was asked to read but couldn't. I walked over and stand in front of it. I stare at the outstretched fingers. Then I take a deep breath and look at the letters. I stay, step right up to the wall and, just like Mr. Daniels taught me, use the envelope in my hand as a marker under the first line. I whisper, some... Things? Mrs. Silver comes and stands behind me. She puts her hands on my shoulders. I stop reading. No, Allie, keep going. I turn my head to look up at her. Can you just read it to me so I can hear it all at once? Mrs. Silver reads, Sometimes the bravest thing you can do is ask for help. See Connors. Page 262. Allie? She asks. I turn. Her voice cracks. I want you to know how sorry I am about the bumpy road we had for a while. I'm proud of all the strides you're making, all the hard work you're doing. We should have picked up on your learning differences before, but you were so bright. And, well, I hope you'll give me another chance to help. I nod, looking over at that poster, think how I should have asked for help. But at the time, it took more bravery than I had, I guess. Hey, she says, didn't you have a letter for me? Yeah, Mr. Daniels said you were supposed to read it before I leave. She opens the envelope and reads as she walks to her desk. Then she laughs and turns toward me. Did he tell you what this says? I shake my head. It says, the student delivering this note is our student of the month for hard work and a good attitude. Me? I ask. Are you sure it isn't a mistake? She laughs. My brother Travis will never believe this, I tell her. But in my heart, I know he will. He'll be happy for me and mess up my hair and say, good going, Al. She writes a note for Mr. Daniels and hands it to me. I leave the office and am told right away to stop running by a teacher. So I do. But it's so hard not to run and jump and yell. Mr. Daniels smiles at me as soon as I turn the corner into the room and I half jump, half run over to his desk. So, you got the message? He asks. I nod. With a hand on my shoulder, he says, Attention, fantasticos! I would like to announce that our student of the month is our own, Allie Nickerson. Oliver slaps his desk while others applaud. Even Jessica. Shay says something I can't hear exactly, but I do hear Jessica answer her. Stop it, Shay. Albert and Keisha come over. Albert with a high five and Keisha with a hug. Wow, are you going to talk to us little people when you win your next award? If you bake for me, I joke. Wait, Albert says. Will you bake for me if I win something? Keisha and I I laugh while Albert says, No, I'm serious. Keisha pats him on the shoulder. Yes, Albert, I'll bake something for you. We begin collecting our things to go home. Travis is picking me up because I have to bring my project home. I get my stuff and head down to the gym to wait. Soon, Travis walks in, still wearing his clothes from the garage. Page 264. The sun from outside is behind him like he's walking out of a ball of light, and all of a sudden I feel like I'm going to cry. It makes sense. Everything does. Travis is smart, in the same ways that I am. I run up to him, put my project down on the floor, and throw my arms around him. Pretty happy to avoid the school bus, huh? He laughs. I'm just really happy to see you, that's all. And I hug him one more time, but tighter. His face questions me. Wait a second, I say. I'll be right back. I turn and run before he can answer. 
I run because I just have to. This can't wait until tomorrow. I sprint down the hallway, ignoring someone far behind me telling me to slow down. I approach my classroom, grab the door frame, and swing into the room out of breath. Mr. Daniels looks up from his work, surprised. Allie? I step up to the side of his desk. I reach into my pocket and pull out the worn piece of paper that says possible. You're still carrying that? He asks and smiles big. Please, Mr. Daniels, I tell him. You have to help. I'll do anything. He stands. What's wrong, Allie? Page 265. Please help my brother. I take a step forward. He needs to learn to read, too. I think of the poster in Mrs. Silver's office. Mr. Daniels' hand reaching for mine and mine reaching for Travis. Of course, Allie. I'm happy to help. Your brother is picking you up today, right? I nod, feeling so grateful for Mr. Daniels. I wonder if he knows that I came to sixth grade wondering what would ever become of me. Now I have dreams I know I'll chase down. I'll set the world on fire someday. And come back here and tell him so. Okay, he says. You go ahead. I'll be down in a minute to talk with him about what we can do. I run from the room but slow down, thinking, aware of every step. Eventually, I'm back at the gym, back to my big brother who has stood by me and helped me always, who has believed in me no matter what I said. Travis is standing there with his hands in his pockets, looking up at the light streaming through the windows across the top of the gym. I watch him for a while. Finally, he sees me and smiles. I hand him the tattered piece of paper that says, Possible. Here, this belongs to you now. He looks confused. For me? Mr. Daniels isn't far behind me. He shakes Travis's hand. Hello there, Travis. I've heard a lot about you. He looks down at me. Quite a little sister you have here. Travis does that half smile. Yeah, she is. So, Mr. Daniels says, apparently Allie thinks we should talk. Okay, he says, brushing his chin with his knuckles. Mr. Daniels explains to him what we do after school and invites him to join us. I look up. Travis swallows hard and nods. I knew Travis would be brave enough to say yes. A mind movie lights up in my head of our last name written in neon lights in the window of Travis's new place. And there's another mind movie of me being happy reading and making my art and finding a special alley-shaped place in the world. But these mind movies won't go into my sketchbook of impossible things, because I know they will actually happen. I lean my back against my big brother and feel his hands on my shoulders. Their voices seem to fade as I look up at that light streaming through the windows. Things are going to be different. It's like birds can swim and fish can fly. Impossible to possible. <laughs>